Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the third day of uh, the virtual course on Business and Human Rights 2020. Uh, I am uh, personally very excited about today's session because it is it couldn't have been uh, as topical as this one is because today we are going to talk about corporate responsibility amidst COVID-19, the unprecedented times that we are living in. We are aware that the impact of COVID has been um, massive especially on the informal sector and uh, even in fact yesterday during the webinar on informal sector we saw a lot of questions that were directed towards the impact of covid on this sector right now so i will very quickly introduce you to today's uh, presenters i have with me uh, justin nolan who is a professor at the university of new south wales as uh, and she is also a visiting scholar at the NY you sent Stern Center for Business and Human Rights. She is joined with Yerne, who is an associate professor of human rights and constitutional law at the European Faculty of Law at the you know, new university, Slovenia. So without eating into much of your time, uh, I am uh, inviting both of you to take us through our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena, and um, we're both very happy to be here today to talk to you about this uh, topic. Thank you all so much for joining us, um, whether you're on the webinar or whether you're on Facebook. Um, we are going to try and keep this as interactive as we can, so um, please send your questions through as we're talking. Um, there are a lot of people, so we may not get to all of your questions, but we'll try and pick them up and um, have some interaction as we go along. Uh, we're also going to do two poll questions, so we're going to ask you to answer a poll um, as we move along um, with this webinar. So this is, um, as was said, this is a probably the most topical issue um, of the week as we look at how companies and governments are responding um, in relation to this massive um, change in our lives, both economically and socially, um, this COVID-19 has impacted us. And so today we're going to try and talk through a little bit about where things stand in international law, um, what rights do we have, how might the rights be limited, can governments and business limit those rights, um, and then we're going to also try and work through some practical examples. We're going to do it um, in conversation with each of us, um, from Slovenia to Australia and all of you in India. Um, we hope this works quite well um, with it as we go along. So I'm just going to by, by start um, by showing you how we hope to structure um, this particular um, session. So we're going to first talk about the actual impact on human rights and what human rights are affected. And we're going to break that down between civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights. Um, and we're going to talk about how, you know, how, what sort of limitations are in the laws around that. Then we're going to look at this broader question of whether COVID-19 has deepened what we call structural inequalities. So sort of the inequalities that were already inbuilt into the system. Um, has COVID-19 deepened those? Have there been any advantages to this pandemic and what, what they might do for rights? Um, in the third section, we're going to talk about um, how companies and governments have um, responded to this and some of the good and the bad practices in relation to this. And then finally, um, the question that we'd like to finish on is whether you think that this pandemic and whether COVID-19 will actually make a difference and, and think how we might come out of this more positively. One of the calls has been as to whether we need a, what's called a social contract. Um, so we'll talk about what that might look like and, and how that impacts um, both workers and um, communities. So I'm going to hand over um, TNA to start this one by talking about this generally impact of COVID-19. Thank you, thank you, just uh, Justine. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to to, to everybody. It's an honor to be here in this uh, virtual summer course on uh, business uh, uh, and human rights. Uh, Justin, myself, uh, already attended in the past years. Uh, this excellent course in uh, in Delhi, organized by Law Institute in Delhi and uh, Professor Surya Deva, Deva and uh, 
we thank uh, Professor Turadea in Oxford, India, for for organizing this this course uh, in this, in these difficult times. But uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, new technologies allow us uh, to connect Slovenia, Australia, and and India and, and beyond, and talk about uh, this very very important issues uh, concerning pandemics, COVID-19, and how the how the pandemics affect uh, affect uh, corporate stability, the daily lives of all of us uh, uh, around 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 the world. So in today's session, we'll basically, as Justin already explained, uh, discuss the main questions as to the rights, what human what human rights, what human rights values have been affected, which human rights are most at risk, both from uh, state uh, interference and also corporate corporate conduct and then we'll address sectors uh, i already see here in the in the questions there are some questions as to the uh, the role of pharmaceutical companies as to the uh, as to the their responsibility whether their responsibility is greater we'll go into that a bit a bit later which countries are more affected uh, we know that uh, uh, covid-19 affected a bit uh, differently different parts of the world most affected uh, have been uh, those countries from global south where most of the workers uh, work in uh, so-called informal economy which are not informal contractual relations employment relations uh, those are the most affected and then we we'll also address which are especially uh, vulnerable uh, vulnerable uh, groups of course i mean when we talk about covid-19 and, and pandemics uh, we have to uh, pay attention to different waves of uh, of COVID-19. Uh, for us here in Europe, uh, we we have witnessed already perhaps a month of easing up of the measures, where uh, companies and also individuals and the governments are getting back to their uh, uh, normal lives. Uh, but nonetheless, in the last week or so, all around Europe, uh, we are witnessing the the, again, the increase of the of the new cases, of course, and of course this affects uh, the the businesses, the daily lives, and also how the governments uh, deal with this uh, this case. And here in Europe, for example, uh, governments adopted different approaches as to the pandemic. Some of them they they declared a state of emergencies. Uh, only a few of them derogated from the uh, from the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, for example, um, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, and, and, and Latvia uh, derogated from uh, from European Convention, whereas quite a lot of um, uh, countries which declared state of emergency did not uh, did not derogate from the European Convention as the main regional human rights treaty, which is comparable to the International Civil Convention on Civil and, uh, and Political uh, uh, Political Right. And uh, just Justin, if you uh, if you if you allow me, if you switch to uh, to the next uh, slide, we can see from the next uh, slide that uh, uh, the the forecast for the for the GDP uh, growth uh, in the recent months from different international organizations, uh, uh, most importantly OECD, are quite um, quite pessimistic. Depending on the country, depending on the continent, uh, OECD predicts uh, uh, a drop. Uh, from five to 15, 20 percent of uh, of uh, GDP, and that of course uh, you know affects uh, both uh, both business activity, but also the daily daily lives of uh, individuals around the world. People are, are getting are getting uh, for love, uh, they're getting uh, la laid off, and uh, they are facing uh, daily difficulties in uh, uh, meeting their daily daily needs, providing for their fam families for. Uh, uh, for surviving, and of course, I mean, as you can see from this slide, there are different scenarios from different for different parts of the world. Some of them are more pessimistic, others more um, more optimistic. But then, when we talk about corporate sustainability in the times of uh, COVID-19, and just if you move to another, another slide, we have to ask ourselves. Uh, uh, which are the, the fundamental values which uh, we have to address uh, in this seminar and when we're talking about corporate uh, corporate stability? And of course, 
the main value which underpins all human rights is uh, the value of um, of uh, human dignity no and uh, human dignity can be understood as a uh, as a uh, you know ba basic survival needs of uh, individuals but also um, in a way amartya sen the indian economist says that each individual if you if she wants to develop herself she has to first take care of these basic need, needs of uh, having a decent shelter, uh, access to, to water, to, uh, to decent, decent health service, services, to, to food, uh, to uh, basic education. And uh, only after that, it has these uh, capabilities. Uh, one, has to, one can uh, develop uh, 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 herself. So for sure, human dignity nowadays in the times of COVID-19 is very, uh, is very under under attacks is uh, at the danger, especially in those communities uh, around the world, which uh, have been under under uh, uh, difficult conditions already before the the pandemic uh, uh, pandemic uh, start. And then the and second I value. To, yeah. Sorry, my interruption on that sure. one sure. for a moment because um, what one one thing we're going to talk about in a minute is how some of the international human rights laws focus on specific yeah. rights. But yeah. one thing to think about is that many countries around the world have not all party to these treaties. So sometimes sure. some of the countries that are most affected by this might not be, um, have what we'd say ratified that treaty. So they're not officially a party to the treaty. But these yeah. co basic concepts and values that we're talking about here underpin all of human rights. And so if you think about yeah. human rights, um, the human dignity being a source of that, then you have to think about what do governments and business do to ensure that each of, each of us in our daily yeah. life have dignity. And from then, you know, we, we focus on specific rights. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly, uh, Justin. Those, those values are, are basically domestic national values. They're gonna come from our national domestic uh, environments and, uh, and systems, and most of the constitutional systems are based on those values. And what, if I mention one more value, and then uh, I hand it to you, uh, Justin, is uh, the value of equality. And this is very much connected to, to what we'll be talking at, at the end of the seminar. How should uh, states and corporations, businesses respond to this COVID-19? Who has the responsibility to, to, uh, to protect, to respect uh, this value of um, uh, human dignity? Do states have obligations, for example, to to introduce the so-called uh, universal uh, incomes for uh, all population, as some European countries have in the last uh, the last mon months, meaning that they give some basic income to to uh, to all individuals living in a particular country, or is this uh, it, the states do not have such a responsibility, or and what uh, what is responsibility of uh, of corporations to to respect Civil and political and uh, social and uh, economical rights. Justin, if you want to uh, take over, yeah. Yeah. Um, so these these sort of values that we've got on the screen now um, are very broad values that underpin the international system of human rights. Um, so it's human dignity, equality, freedom, justice, and the rule of law. And what we've seen with the COVID 19, 19 pandemic is that these have all been impacted in different ways. We've seen racism and discrimination. We've, people, we've seen the limitation on people's freedom of movement and freedom of speech. Um, we've seen lockdowns pursued, you know, that we would say would, some of them are against justice and the rule of law. Um, and many of the actions that have impact on workers means that their human dignity has been sacrificed. So before we go to the next slide, we might do our first poll. Um, Oxfam, if you wouldn't mind launching that first poll, um, we're gonna ask you to respond to this poll and then we will come back to the next um, discussion. Yes, yeah, so, so the question of the first, uh, the first poll is, uh, do you think COVID-19 will make companies rethink their approach to supply chain manufacturing? And you can answer yes uh, uh, or no. 
So we can see that there's a lot of votes coming in um, at the moment for uh, a yes vote, um, with half of you have already voted and 93% um, say yes in relation to this. I'll just give it a couple more um, seconds so everybody gets a chance to vote and then we'll, we'll go on. While we're waiting for the poll, um, I can see some of the great questions that you're um, putting in. Some of them are really specific, which we're going to get to, particularly around the notion of how might contracts in global supply chains um, help or harm um, workers in relation to this? And some of you have noticed um, from Rakesh, he says um, some contracts have a clause around force majeure, meaning that there's sort of this unexpected event uh, might that happen. Um, we're going to come to that and what responsibilities companies might have and whether they have the right to terminate. So we can see that the poll's now closed and that basically overwhelmingly 93% of you um, said yes uh, to that. Um, so we'll move on to the next, um, our next slide before we get into the specific um, rights. And mm -hmm. this one you can see, we've just highlighted here for you um, the disproportionate impact that the pandemic is having, that we know that everybody in, around the world is being impacted in some way, but what we're seeing is that there's some people who are way more vulnerable um, to this. Um, in, workers in the inform, informal economy, um, and I know you've already had a session on that this week, um, women and children, um, women um, particularly are disproportionately affected. There are a lot of the time they are the makeup um, a lot of the low paid um, supply chain jobs. Uh, human rights defenders, so human rights advocates who are trying to speak out both against governments and companies uh, um, are being, some of them are being put in jail. Um, some of them are new laws to make them not able to speak out that dissent isn't being tolerated. Um, and then there's particular individuals who may be living and working in countries where the rule of law is not so sort of solidly protected. Um, and so there's questions uh, around how how that's operating with it. Um, so and I also might just any, go on I mean, to the, do you, do you want to take a couple of questions? Yeah, before we come, yeah. Yeah, just, just concerning the vulnerable groups, I mean, uh, of course, uh, the, the status also in this crisis depends uh, also in which industry workers are, are engaging, you know, for example, uh, the crisis uh, has, the, for the moment, less affected those who, who work in state or public administration. Uh, whereas, uh, for example, uh, workers who work in uh, in retail or uh, services industry, they have been heavily, heavily um, uh, affected. Whereas, for example, uh, at least here in Europe, you know, those workers and employees who work in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, one could see a really rise in uh, the prices of share, shares of most pharmace European pharmaceutical uh, companies in the, uh, in the recent uh, recent uh, months. For example, here in Slovenia, the largest Slovenian company is a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical called Kirka, and its uh, its share really raised by 15, if I'm not 15 to 20 euros just, just during the pandemics because they, they the demand was so so much greater as uh, as uh, as uh, as before. So also this uh, question of vulnerability uh, in times of crisis depends on the on the on the industry uh, sector uh, where where workers are employed uh, and companies uh, do uh, do business. Yeah. So I can see um, before we go into the next one, we might just take um, pick out a couple of oh. questions um, to uh, to talk. And there's a good question here. That I was just responding to um, to give us an overall picture. Um, does the onus of providing effective remedy lie on the state or the company? And in something like um, when you've learned this week about the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, you'll see that there's a, a joint sort of obligation on companies and governments to provide remedy. But you'll, what we'll start to see and unpack is that there's often a legal obligation on governments and the company might have this tied up in this notion of a responsibility to respect, which is this societal expectation. So there is some difference between legal obligations and a responsibility to respect. Both have this sense of needing to provide a remedy, but it's harder to enforce um, in some circumstances. 
you want to take any uh, any question, Jenna? Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, there is one question as to the um, uh, infringements of privacy rights uh, by state and and, uh, and companies. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, here in Europe, there is a lot of uh, debates as to the um, mobile 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 applications that some governments have already introduced in the last months, and some governments are thinking of introducing as to you know tracking the the COVID uh, COVID cases infected, those infected, or those is, those in quarantine. They're mostly on a based on a voluntary basis. Uh, uh, Unless uh, they they apply for those people who are in quarantine or those who are um, uh, who, uh, who have COVID and they are they have to stay at, at home. And here, uh, there's a lot of debates, a lot of a lot of um, uh, skepticism on the part of the part of civil society as to these uh, applica uh, applications. Um, nonetheless, if I answer, answer the question, of course, right to privacy is a is a it's a human right, no? But uh, it's uh, it's not absolute human rights. It's a relative, a relative human rights, which means that uh, states do have some margin of appreciation. They have some discretion uh, whether um, to to go, to go into right to privacy. And there, of course, the proportionality principle. And of course, here here there is a dilemma: where to find the right balance between the the right to privacy of individuals, all of us, you know, who are using our mobile phones and apps and other electronic uh, electronics, uh, and then on the other side, side is collective value of public health, protection of uh, uh, public uh, public health, and um, this uh, this uh, right balance is often um, difficult uh, difficult to find. And most of these apps, for example, in France, uh, Germany, uh, and Italy, they they operate on voluntary basis. You know, so people can choose whether to download the application or, or or not. Some countries now they are considering the compulsory nature for those people who are in, in quarantine. But of course, uh, I would say that one one can only infringe the right to privacy in order to protect public health if uh, the location information and personal information individuals. Are very much uh, protected. I would only say that these applications could work if uh, if they function on this uh, Bluetooth uh, technology technology, and that are you know that they are separate. That this technology is separated from personal data of uh, and location information of uh, in, in uh, of in individuals. You know? uh, so of course, right, privacy is a uh, is a uh, of, of concern uh, here also in the in the COVID um, crisis. Let us uh, look at some. Yeah, yeah so we're going to get to more detail about these particular rights. But what we're going to do now is just give you a chance to read um, these two sort of hypothetical scenarios. And we're not going to answer them now, um, but we're going to come back to them. Um, yeah. And then we're going to come back to them as we go through. Yeah, do you want to just read this one? Um, and then I'll read the next one. Yeah, this is a case which I uh, uh, drafted. It's a case, it's a case which, is, uh, which we read often nowadays in the newspapers. It's a case uh, uh, about the company A, which is uh, manufacturing automotive parts, and it's experiencing downturn uh, in the, in demand due to a pandemic. And then the company decides to to fall off, to put on a waiting list 40% of its workers. Uh, and then after a couple of months, uh, as the demand does not uh, increase increases, it decides to um, uh, to to lay off. Uh, Hundreds of its workers. One of them, one of, the, one of these workers who works for a company A is also Michael. Michael, Michael doesn't get uh, uh, get laid off, but he's worried about uh, this that maybe he will be laid, laid out in the next round. Uh, and he's worried about uh, his family, and he decides uh, together with his co-workers to to uh, to join the company trade union and he starts to protest against the company and the government uh, which did not provide any social assistance for laid over laid off uh, workers uh, and then at the end the protests uh, are crushed by the company private security and the government turns uh, a blind eye to to workers demand and here's a question which you can think through over the the next uh, 
15 minutes or so is uh, what rights are uh, relevant here and uh, to which mechanisms, to which judicial, non judicial mechanisms uh, can Michael uh, turn to? And we'll come back to, um, to this question uh, uh, at the end of the uh, lecture. So that's one question. Um, and then the next scenario you're just going to think about for now, and we're going to come back to later, is this one where you say X is a company that's manufacturing gloves and is experiencing high demand due to the pandemic. The company requires all its workers to work extra overtime. It provides workers with gloves at work, but no masks. Workers work closely on the production line and travel to and from work together on the company bus. Sia works at the factory and she's concerned about her health. So we're gonna come back to this question about what rights might be impacted here and then what actions she might take um, in relation to this. Mm. So we're gonna try and go quickly through, because um, time always gets away from us, quickly through a couple of the rights um, and then some of the details about how governments might limit rights and then we'll come back to those scenarios. So this slide just sets out the really big picture of some of the um, international treaties that would be relevant to this type of discussion. So we've just pulled out what's called the International Bill of Rights, um, and particularly of interest to us would be the International Covenant on the Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, but also when we're talking about labour rights, we'd also want to be very familiar with the treaties of the International Labour Organization, ILO, and it has what it calls eight fundamental rights, sorry, eight fundamental treaties, um, which deal with forced labour, um, the right to organise, um, non-discrimination and child labour. And so these are, these are treaties that it's worth you familiarising yourself with and understanding um, in the context of understanding business and human rights. Um, so then I'm gonna hand over to you to talk a little bit about what rights in this in the in the context of COVID nineteen are most at risk, which are civil and political rights? Yeah, as for civil and political rights uh, goes, there are many instances where they they were infringed and they can be infringed, and there are many many interesting questions as to the you know responsibility of uh, businesses, corporations to provide uh, to ensure respect. For example, right to, right to life, which is the absolute right. There was a question, and we, I can connect here uh, as to the role of pharmaceutical companies, not the the sector which uh, produces the 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 vaccine, the, the medicines for um, for uh, diseases, and uh, is now developing different medicines for COVID-19. Because usually, traditionally, we talk that uh, only state have obligations to to respect right to life and ensure that. Also, other private actors do not infringe uh, on the on the right to life. But nonetheless, here I would I would venture uh, venture to say to submit that also businesses have a role to play in, in ensuring the the respect for um, a right uh, right to, li to life, both in prevention aspect, but also then uh, in um, in the protection of uh, uh, right to life. And you will see later uh, we have some slides. Uh, uh, there are some pharmaceutical companies who who got really inf involved in uh, in developing the medicines, in providing already the the medicines for um, uh, for uh, vulnerable communities around around uh, Europe, around the around the world, uh, such as Novartis and Astra Astra uh, Zeneca. So companies also themselves, you know, they 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 consider themselves that they that they are at least ethically, if not legally, bound by by right, um, right uh, to life. Another right which uh, can be can be affected here is uh, human dignity, and here prohibition of torture and human and uh, uh, degrading uh, treatment. This is particularly concerning, you know, the treatment of uh, of patients patients uh, of COVID nineteen, those who are uh, uh, who have to be placed in intensive units. We know that that a lot of countries in global south, uh, not only in global south, but also here in Europe, uh, in, in the months of March and April, April have a lot of difficulty difficulties in providing enough uh, beds uh, of inten intensive care units for uh, for the for COVID uh, pa uh, pa uh, patients. And 
we have we have seen already some really uh, uh, worrying uh, examples for example of uh, of uh, elderly homes private elderly homes in in madrid barcelona where uh, where uh, those homes uh, did not want to take care uh, uh, as they should for elderly elderly pensions and also the staff um, in some of the homes in, in Madrid just escaped from uh, uh, from their facilities because they were afraid that they will get affected by by COVID and they left they left the elderly persons uh, uh, just there alone and that's why only in Madrid thousands of uh, elderly persons in, in uh, elderly homes uh, died and here uh, one could talk about corporate facility for for you know. Uh, 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 prohibition of uh, uh, inhuman inhuman treatment. Uh, then, of course, uh, we already mentioned right to private life, right to family life, and more importantly, there are a lot of examples as to the freedoms, uh, such as freedom of speech and press, assembly, association, also discrimination. Unfortunately, a lot of governments around the world, and in some instances, also coupled joint with uh, some private uh, enterprise enterprises, they used or they're still using this pandemic to trump upon, to infringe these uh, basic rights of freedom of assembly, freedom of, of associations. Uh, uh, some some countries, uh, they adopted just blanket blanket prohibitions of assembly and uh, associations. Uh, we have only, we have also seen really uh, quite worrying examples of uh, denial of COVID-19 coming from uh, a number of, of head of uh, states just think of uh, brazilian president bolsonaro or the or the us president of uh, trump who, who are generally systematically denying the the, the but the brazilian the president I... now has tested positive so sorry, he can no longer, the brazilian president has now tested positive so he can no longer deny it yeah yeah definitely <laughs> yeah 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 so there's a lot of worrying development as to also as to as to freedoms, not only as to civil and political uh, uh, rights and business sector has played some uh, some of uh, good practices role, but could have done more in this uh, uh, respect. Uh, one should not only place responsibility on governments, also also businesses have responsibility to uh, to to comply with these rights with these rights in times of pandemics. Just in the one to so, uh, the one to yeah, start so, yeah. so yeah, so these examples you can see we've pulled out of the the, the specific treaties, and um, this these ones talk about the, the the rights that are economic, social, and cultural rights. And in particular, in this context, we think about the rights to work. Um, these are also set out in the conventions of the ILO. But here you can just see the language that is used in the treaties. Um, so the idea that everybody has this right to sort of health and safety um, in, in their working conditions, that they have a right to fair wages, that they have a right to decent living. Now we know that's not how the world works, that not everybody, that not all these rights are recognized. But part of what the human rights treaties are trying to do is set a standard that um, governments should aspire to, and that's what they should be aiming for. So these treaties don't um, bind companies. So these treaties are aimed at governments. And when you attended the other webinars this week, you can see that there's this document called the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which we'll get to later. Um, but that, that gives guidance to companies. But again, companies aren't legally obliged to do this by something from the UN, by a UN treaty. So these are some of the rights. Um, we've talked about the right to work. There's also something called the right to an adequate standard of living in Article 11, which talks about the right of people to have access to food, um, clothing, housing, and water within that as well. So what happens if a pandemic hits and people aren't able to access food? Whose responsibility is it? And then also there, the right to health, which is particularly um, relevant at the moment, that the right of everybody to sort of, you know, have access to um, medical care. Um, and again, this is varied um, uh, country by country. And as, as the pandemic has put enormous strain on um, governments, we'll see that these rights have not been fulfilled. 
So one thing we should just um, set the scene about before we get to sort of the specific examples is also to know that when we talk about economic, social and cultural rights, the treaties talk about this notion that there's this essential minimum core that government should provide to their people. And the idea is that people should have access to food, healthcare, housing, and the most basic forms of education. Again, we, you know, it's completely obvious that this is not fulfilled around the world, but this is what is the idea that companies, have, uh, that governments have to aim for in relation to it. So our, one of our first questions that we should discuss now is whether governments, that states, can limit these type of rights. So the public emergency that we're facing now, um, can they basically say, well, we can't do anything about it and we're taking away your right to healthcare um, and what might happen um, in relation to this? So governments can limit rights and in certain circumstances, they can also suspend rights. Um, and, they, and it may vary depending on which particular rights uh, that we're talking about. So you can see here the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, sets out this general notion that rights aren't absolute and that there's that governments have to be able to limit rights, but it also restricts what you can limit them for. And so that gives you the example that often rights might be limited in order to have some balance, that you respect the rights of others um, or the reasons of this general sort of public order. Um, sometimes they say morality, general welfare, and another time, sometimes they also use the example of national security. So we're giving you one specific example there of a limitation um, that, you know, I was talking about the right to freedom of speech, the right that you as an individual have the right to speak out and hold opinions without interference. But you should also see that the, the international human rights law notes that this right can be specifically limited, but it has to be done according to these the, the, the limitations that are set out here. So it can be limited um, if, if it's for the rights and reputation of others or for the protection of national security or public order or public health. So some of the examples he was already talking about, about governments have put limitations on rights. What you would be thinking about are, are they within the parameters of Article 19.3? Does it seem legitimate or is government pushing the boundaries and, and restricting people's ability to speak out or to question what the government is doing and it's not in a, in a way that's contemplated um, by the treaty? Um, more generally, um, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has this very general limitation clause where, again, it talks about governments having the right to limit rights as long as it's done by law and, again, as long as they can show it's for the purpose of um, the general welfare on society. So that the treaties note that, the right, that rights aren't absolute, but they're also saying that if you're going to limit it, it's got to be done in a way that um, is proportional and is contemplated by law. So if we show you this sort of um, summary, um, you can see here that the question that you need to ask when, the, when states try and limit your rights is that are they being done um, in a way that is legitimate? Um, and can it be justified by law and can it be justified according to the limitations that the treaty set out? So some of the things you might think about here are where, whether the objectives that are involved in the limitation, are, is it something that the government is just trying to do because it doesn't, it's inconvenient. It doesn't want to hear people criticising that its response to the pandemic is not sufficient. That wouldn't be considered a legitimate li limitation. Um, is it something that just they want to make a limitation because they think people don't agree with it. And so they're trying to shut down um, free, free speech in this way. Um, and does it show that a government is basically making a limitation that's consistent um, with non-discriminatory values, that tolerant and broad-mindedness? And I think what we've been discussing so far is that some limitations that governments have put in place um, are very targeted at particular individuals or particular rights and they would not be considered legitimate um, by the international community. So that's what we're going to come back to, but the notion that the limitations can exist 
um, but there's parameters of what they uh, should look like. Um, you know, do you want to take this one about rights being suspended? Yeah, yeah. Of course, I mean, even during the public emergency and uh, derogation from international human rights treaties, uh, states uh, are not allowed, you know, they, they don't have like just uh, carte blanche, they don't have uh, full discretion to do whatever that they want. Also during public emergency and, uh, uh, and the state of emergency, they have to comply at least with uh, absolute rights. Absolute rights are mostly those who do not allow for any kind of exceptions and derogations, and those are mostly, you know, right to life, prohibition of torture and human treatment, prohibition of uh, of slavery, uh, right to liberty and uh, security, some parts of right to um, to fair trials, such as a uh, right independent uh, and uh, impartial uh, tribunal. Those are, those those rights are uh, outside debate. States are obliged to to comply with them also in times of uh, in times of emergency and of course when states uh, declare emergency you know there are some conditions as Justin already mentions uh, mentioned uh, which they have to comply in. of course the those state of emergency in public uh, public emergency cannot be indefinite they have to be limited in uh, in time and for example here in Europe most of the governments uh, they have extended uh, every week or every two weeks the state of emergency and every week or every two weeks they check whether there still exist conditions in order to restrict uh, you know assembly uh, or freedom of movement uh, and, uh, uh, and so on of course there were some exceptions such as the government of hungary which uh, imposed indefinite uh, uh, public emergency but nonetheless, the human rights bodies and European Court of Human Rights uh, have very strict conditions in order to, to, to for the for this public emergency to be in compliance with international human rights treaty. And here in this uh, in this uh, slide, you can see criteria which European Court of Human Rights uh, applies when deciding uh, whether the derivation, whether state derogations are in compliance with the European Convention on Human Rights Fundamental Treaties. Freedoms. They say first uh, the threat uh, to to public security or public health has to be imminent. It has to concern the whole nation. Uh, it has to also endanger the organized life of community. Uh, and then uh, the crisis or, or danger has to be has to be exceptional. And even after those uh, uh, criteria are applied. Uh, the, the court looks at, uh, uh, at the situation from proportionality uh, principle. So, absolute derogation of absolute rights will never be accepted. Derogations from relative rights, such as association, assembly, uh, perhaps freedom of speech, they will be justified if the state can prove they, they that they were necessary at a given time to protect a larger value, such as such as public uh, public health. For example, uh, in a lot of countries, there have been discussion as to the prohibition of public assembly. No? Uh, as states, they, they protected public health by uh, prohibiting gatherings of more than five persons, ten persons. Uh, and in that in that respect, uh, those uh, those uh, derogations from freedom of assembly they will only be accepted. If the state allows uh, shows that it allowed expression of dissent of criticisms in a, another way, so for example, uh, in Germany uh, there were gatherings uh, which uh, took in account uh, distance. Uh, in many countries, including here in Slovenia, people uh, de people demonstrated by bicycles. You know, they they were driving by bicycles around the state institutions. And through that, they were expressing their dissent and criticisms. So proportionality has to has to be uh, uh, applied in this uh, uh, in this uh, aspect. Now we are moving to, to next 
Yeah, which so is, so we've set up this notion in which you know sort of saying that there are yeah. limitations on rights and um, but it's yeah. got to be done in a legal manner that you know with it. But we know that that's exactly. not happening in the in the pandemic. Yeah. So then, yeah. what we're seeing now, the question is, which some of you have been raising um, in your in the chat, is basically saying, yeah, but companies and governments aren't doing this. And so our question, you know, sort of the what what is becoming obvious now is that what we're seeing is that the COVID-19 um, is really deepening this notion of structural inequality. That people who were at the bottom of the supply chain and the most vulnerable people are actually getting impacted disproportionately more than others. So yeah. the sort of the gap between the ones at the top and the bottom is widening more um, with this pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And, and for example, uh, there are many ways how uh, COVID-19 uh, deepened structural inequalities uh, and affected vulnerable communities. First, we have seen that um, the salaries of employees have increasingly decreased uh, across uh, all uh, sectors of, uh, of industry. Perhaps the only exception here was the public administration uh, uh, sector and the companies laid off workers or placed them on the waiting list. And then we can uh, see that especially workers on the front lines of uh, pandemics response, such as uh, workers in health, law enforcement, logistics have been exposing themselves to, to health uh, uh, risks. Then as some of, some of you mentioned in the questions, small businesses and self-employed have been uh, generally experiencing a lower or even zero incomes and uh, thereby subjecting themselves and their families to, dif to social economic difficulties. Then, of course, one of the issues we have noticed here, here in Europe, uh, perhaps also in Australia, Justin, has been uh, the effect of pandemics on the on the work-life balance. Uh, and the majority of schools uh, and universities uh, have been uh, moved to, to online uh, education, and thereby parents were had to cope between their work. Uh, and uh, family responsibilities because the whole family was the, the whole pandemic saying, uh, at home. And then, uh, as you said, uh, workers in the informal economy have been hit especially, especially hard because, uh, as you know, workers in the informal economy, they don't, they don't have usual contractual or statutory protection as workers in a formal employment relations, relationships uh, uh, have. And if you look at uh, some other sli slides, uh, which uh, show uh, uh, also, just if you move one more, yeah. Uh, if you, uh, yeah, yeah, if you look at uh, the slides showing the fact of the pandemics, uh, one could see that uh, there is a really, there's a lot of uh, impacts on the global remittances, which have declined in almost, uh, uh, all uh, all continents, and then if you look at the next uh, at the next slide, which is quite uh, really interesting, how how the 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 pandemics affects uh, global inequality, and uh, here you have a graph uh, which uh, shows the predicted change in Gini uh, coefficient. I'm not sure if uh, if you know what is Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient is a is an indicator which measures the income uh, and also wealth inequality. And we say uh, if a Gini coefficient is lower, it's, it means that the society is more or less uh, equal as to the as to the incomes or, or or wealth. If the if the Gini coefficient is higher, then we say that the society is extremely uh, unequal, unequal in, in terms of wealth and income. And here we can see on the graph quite um, quite interesting uh, uh, graph, which was uh, drafted by uh, by uh, economists. Uh, how how the Gini coefficient will change in the years after the pandemic uh, uh, effect? And you, you can see that uh, what they predict is that the inequality both global and national inequality will will increase uh, 
in the in the next uh, in the next years, and that the Gini co coefficient will will increase in a most of all uh, uh, region regions. And uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I was going to say that I mean, mostly what we're seeing coming out of this is bad news um, for it. And there was a good question um, that I just saw. It said um, from Samaya, I think. The UN has claimed that this pandemic has taken us back by many years in all fronts. It also claimed that it will affect the SDGs intended to be achieved by 2030. Can mm -hmm. BHR help in preventing this situation? Um, so the idea of business and human rights in part is that this notion of shared responsibility um, between governments and uh, companies, um, but it's obviously, you know, even that is not going to solve this problem. And I think that this will seriously set back the achievement of um, the SDGs uh, in relation to this. And then just one other one here yeah. is, um, I think that now that we're talking about this, there's a question around um, from Dominique, what is the concrete example of a practice from other countries yeah. where the government has removed barriers for informal, vulnerable or low income workers to access social safety net during the COVID-19 crisis? Um, can you think of an example where that's happened of where um, there's been access given to um, low income or informal workers out of this? Well, at least from the European context, there are, there are several examples from um, many different national contexts. Uh, for example, French, Italian, Spanish uh, governments, they introduced uh, really wide ranging holistic social packages aiming at uh, providing uh, not only for workers who are laid off or, or put on waiting lists, but also uh, those who are on uh, uh, at the end of um, uh, at the margins of, uh, of of society and provide them with uh, basic uh, basic incomes. And what what is interesting, what what you have seen that this pandem pandemic is that uh, you may aware, you may be aware of this idea of a basic uh, universal income, which uh, many governments many governments have fought off very intentionally in the last uh, couple of years. At least here in Europe, but now in the, in the last couple of months. Uh, many governments, especially in the southern uh, in South Europe, they have employed these uh, uh, measures of basic income. Mo mo basically, the governments introduced uh, uh, some kind of uh, some kind of basic incomes for uh, for most of the populations uh, for the time of uh, duration of uh, uh, pandemic. So this could be one of one of the uh, examples. Yeah. Yeah, so we might just go here, we might, Oxfam, we might launch our second poll um, in relation to this to see what people um, agree, think about with the, with the poll. Yeah, so the, the, the second question is, uh, do you agree that the COVID-19 pandemic will slow down development of binding business and human rights uh, regulations? Uh, you so may know, Edmond. Yeah. Sorry, you, ahead, you, know from other, yeah. you know from other classes that we've spoken about that they're in development at the moment is discussions around a business and human rights treaty, whether there should be a specific treaty on business and human rights. And this has been a longer discussion, but since 2014, the United Nations has been involved in this. And so we're asking, do you think this is going to slow it down or perhaps people might see the need for it and it will speed up? Hmm. Particularly now, um like we are uh, at the times where we're discussing negotiation, negotiations on business human rights treaty in October, there will be a sixth round of the of the negotiations. Uh, we will see whether the pandemic uh, will affect the negotiations. There are already some proposals which proposals trying to water down the the current uh, uh, draft of the. UN Business Human Rights Treaty. Uh, so we'll see whether whether the COVID will affect the uh, the the last the last uh, uh, the last uh, developments uh, in, in the COVID uh, nineteen pandemic and Business Human Rights Treaty. Yeah. And we can see from your responses that the majority of you, um, eighty nine percent believe yes, it will slow down and 11% yeah. um, think no. So I think ma many of you, and I think you're probably right um, on that one, that many of you think that it will slow down. There was a, 
Uh, one of the questions says, um, I think is quite pertinent right now um, from Smaya says, obligations are clearly not enough at the moment in the inter of international human rights law in the treaties. Um, she says that this just decreases the authority of international law because international law has this enforcement problem. Um, and then puts it quite nicely, how to move ahead from this state of stillness. Um, because sometimes we think about right. international law as quite stagnant um, in many ways and that we know that international law and human rights treaties has this enforcement problem, which is why in part the business and human rights movement is trying to move it ahead um, by also involving um, business in as part of the solution. So I think we should, um, given the time and we want to get to our scenarios, we'll move on a little bit quickly here, but we want to look at now at some, some examples of how governments and businesses have um, responded and how do the UN guiding principles apply. Um, the guiding principles apply to businesses everywhere. Like, so it's the smallest companies at the bottom to the largest multinationals um, at the top. Um, but what we'll often see is, you know, different responses in relation to that. We know that there have been some great examples, um, but also some bad examples um, of how them have. And we've seen, we've seen sort of disproportionate um, discriminatory lockdown of certain people. I mean, you know, in India, um, the lockdown happened so quickly that you saw this forced march of, wow. of particularly of many people back to hometowns of their migrant workers moving back because they lost all ability to earn an income from the cities. Um, and that placed great hardship um, on many people. Um, the sort of the compulsory self-isolation fact of the health regime, the closure of borders, both within states and between states. Um, in my own country, we just had an outbreak in one of our states, and so that border has just closed again um, to all other states. Um, the abuse of emergency powers, uh, we have seen that no doubt, um, in, both in terms of the silencing of dissent the use of surveillance equipment, um, the, the lockdown of people um, and not used uh, you know, evenly amongst all people, the abuse of technology, as I said, facial recognition technology, um, surveillance technology, some of it's been required to track the health crisis, but some of it has been used um, disproportionately and the massive impact um, that we've seen on supply chains and particularly the workers at the bottom um, of those supply chains. Um, with it. So um, the one of the questions I can see here um, from Ankita is the when a violation of human rights when various companies are moving their sort of employees around um, without notice um, and, she, and she says what kind of CSR would be applicable then? I think it's worth remembering the sort of the distinction between CSR and BHR which we discussed mm. on Monday that CSR is often this um, voluntary philanthropic um, notion that companies might spend money on building houses or on education. Um, we know the Indian law has this compulsory CSR spend. When we talk about business and human rights, we're talking about businesses respecting the basic dignity of people and respecting the basic rights as part of the way they do business. So it's not so much about how they spend their money, it's about how they make their money. So the way that they're making their money is done in a way that's consistent with basic rights. And that's what we're talking about in relation to um, business and human rights. Mm -hmm. um, there's been and of a, course, uh, uh, just, just in if, I, if I may, uh, of course, I mean, uh, among the, the, worst, the worst examples as to the business activities was, at least here in Europe, uh, was uh, just uh, giving up the businesses due diligence built in hospitals and uh, elderly homes where as i said earlier where some businesses they just did not take their take their obligations seriously to protect human li li lives and to protect right right to health but of course on the other hand there, there have been also very very uh, very good examples you know, examples of best practices where a lot of businesses from pharmaceutical industry, uh, industry they got very heavily involved in the uh, development of the medicines or they were providing um, you know the the materials uh, for the hospitals and, and so on one of one of the issues here one could also uh, highlight is the, at least here i'm not sure justin in australia how was the situation there 
in the in the first uh, first uh, months. Here in Europe, we, we have seen a lot of um, bad practices, particularly by uh, companies by, uh, based in uh, in China, who are uh, who are you know, supplying European uh, hospitals and governments with uh, uh, protective gear and uh, hospital uh, equipment. And they were at many occasions pressuring uh, the government, European governments, European uh, government, uh, European companies, uh, putting very excessive predatory business conditions on them because, of course, the the, the material at the time was uh, not available, and also the question of the of the ventilator, ventilators, respiratory uh, machines, which are needed for uh, for um, treatment of COVID. Patients were very scarce at the time, and we, we saw a lot of uh, very predatory uh, practices by some Chinese uh, companies. And of course, one one has to say, submit here that this is totally unacceptable. That businesses at, at the time of pandemic, when uh, human dignity and right of health are at stake, are, are trying to take advantage of uh, very vulnerable uh, positions of any government. Of companies, but of course, at the end of uh, of patients and also general population uh, population of any of, uh, of any country. Of course, nowadays, more or less, at least in Europe, uh, situation is is uh, calm. Governments have bought these ventilators and respir respirators, uh, but of course, in the other parts of the world, we still uh, hear stories of. Uh, Hospitals running out, <laughs> running out of ventilators, respirators, and and uh, one has to make sure that businesses do not exploit you know, the human dignity of uh, of patients and uh, public health. So one term, one of the calls that we just want to sort of raise at this point, and um, we'll because I want to get to our scenarios is what some people have been arguing is that this pandemic has basically made the world think that things really need to change um, and that we can't just go back to business as usual after this is over whether it's next year or the year after um, and so people like the international trade union confederation the ilo um, and others are talking about the notion that we need to sort of develop a new social contract that we need to rethink the relationships between government, between business and between workers. Um, we need to rethink business models. We need to rethink the way wages are paid and the disproportionate amount of wages that particularly as it goes through supply chains. Um, so this idea of a social contract is almost the idea that we as individuals enter into a sort of a, a contract for decent work. Um, with companies as a whole, with governments as a whole, and that we put greater emphasis on the nature of the decency of work rather mm. than just profits. Um, and so it's sort of, it's not saying that companies shouldn't be focused on profits, but they must be focused on people and profits and that we can't go through and keep sort of destroying the planet, destroying the people um, and expecting no, no bad results. So there's more radical concepts of this and there's sort of incremental notions of it. But I think what the pandemic at the very least has, ta has taught us is that the current mode we have um, isn't working for everyone. We knew that. Um, and so how do we how do we make this change um, with it? We might, um, I was thinking we might go to our scenario so we get a chance to, um, these, sure. we'll, and we'll come, if we have time, we'll come back to some of these, um, aspects and you're going to get all these slides so you can take your time and these and some of these slides are talking about the examples before about how some countries um, have focused on best practice um, in yeah. relation to there's a there's an interesting question here by Vlada Gurovic uh, she she asks uh, how long will it take for human rights issues to recover from uh, COVID impact uh, it's a very very difficult question. You know, one one will have to be a fortune teller to, to to answer that. But in any in any event, I would I would submit that uh, human rights and particularly in business human rights context will will take a, a huge toll, particularly in uh, in global south in weak uh, regulatory environments 
where governments perhaps have a authoritarian take or a dictatorial take there uh, there uh, we, we have seen already examples from uh, from almost <laughs> every continent that current uh, head, current heads of states are taking advantage of uh, these pandemics to even further limit limit the rights and, and often often in a, in a, in a concert with uh, with a powerful uh, business uh, uh, business uh, enterprises so, so let's come, yeah. come back to the scenario. You want to start with your scenario to think about how we how we think this through. Yeah, there's a, it's a, it's a it's a question uh, which basically concerns about uh, civil and political rights and social economic rights. Uh, it concerns uh, rights such as uh, right to work, but then also indirectly rights such as uh, you know uh, decent shelter, right to right to food, right to water, right to education. How can workers uh, provide for their families if they're laid uh, off or put on a, on a waiting list? Uh, and then uh, from the civil, civil uh, uh, and political rights context there, here we're talking about right to protest, right to express criticism against uh, one's government, uh, freedom of speech, right to assembly, association, one could uh, one could here identify that uh, the company private security forces for sure uh, violated the right to uh, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, right to collective bargaining, you know, which is uh, which is a uh, universally accepted uh, right uh, across across the world. Uh, and then for the government not to protect workers, uh, right to uh, assembly, uh, right to uh, freedom association uh, the government has failed its positive obligation to do to, to do so and also the government uh, has failed uh, its obligation to you know to offer uh, social assistance to ensure at least a minimum core of uh, social economic rights to to uh, laid off workers uh, uh, into michael's uh, michael's family so one then one answer here would be that governments and uh, and uh, uh, businesses have a shared responsibility to provide both for uh, social economical and civil and political rights. But of course, governments have even greater responsibility. They have positive obligations to ensure that private actors such as businesses provide for uh, for those rights. The second question is more difficult. Where can Michael turn uh, turn to? And it's also connected to the to the the several questions you pose in the the chat uh, chat room of course the most obvious answer the, the best bet you know would be to turn uh, to the domestic mechanisms first turn to uh, perhaps uh, national human rights uh, commission or ombudsman office or try to start uh, uh, a labor claim or civil rights claim before uh, domestic judicial uh, courts if if we are in the country uh, where uh, judiciary is quite uh, quite strong such as in india uh, one could go to to one could start uh, civil or criminal proceedings but then one could also you know try to use um, non state based uh, mechanisms uh, one could uh, uh, raise complaint with a company a one could also go to uh, international mechanisms. If company A is a, is a multinational, for example, based in a, uh, based in uh, in Germany, one could submit a complaint with, uh, uh, before the national contact point under the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. So the best bet, the best strategy is to look first which mechanism has the most chances to succeed in a particular domestic mechanism and then choose accordingly uh, i would advise turn to turn to the domestic mechanisms first and only later try to look for uh, international mechanism or perhaps uh, another dom domestic mechanisms in a in a home state in a home country of a company 
company A. So here's a question for you from, um, coming from the chat. How do yeah. you balance the rights of the employers and employees under business and human rights as both are affected due to the pandemic? Yeah, it's a difficult question. Yeah. Of course, uh, one, one has to first look whether the uh, employers, businesses have, have complied with their uh, statutory constitutional uh, obligations under business human rights, whether they have performed due diligence, whether they have, uh, you know, introduced uh, health and safety measures. Uh, of course, I mean, even the, during the time of pandemics, the pandemics do not, the pandemics the, does not absolve businesses' obligations, for example, to provide for uh, preventive gear for the workers or uh, to provide for uh, uh, protective materials for, for the workers. The businesses still have obligations to, to provide for health and uh, uh, health and, uh, and safety. I'm not sure we can uh, we can talk about the, the balance. I would rather uh, talk about uh, respecting rule of law. Businesses also during the pandemics have to respect uh, comply with uh, comply with uh, rule of law. Particularly when we are talking about such such a basic rights such as the freedom of association, freedom uh, of assembly. Of course, when we go to the social economic rights, there. There, uh, there is also a specificity of government, perhaps, to try to help assist the businesses uh, to cover part of the salaries during the pandemic, especially, especially if, the, if the, com the company witnessed uh, the downturn of the, of the incomes uh, uh, the, during that, uh, that time, then the government would have also shared responsibility. And one of the um, examples like this um, that has been alleged during the pandemic relates to Amazon, right? Um, where there's arguments that Amazon yeah. Um, yeah. fired a worker because of he was seeking the right to protest. Amazon said that was not the case, um, but that was an example um, that people have been looking at as, as not a good practice example in relation to that. Um, yeah. The, the question that you raise, um, I think, is a really good one about how you balance the rights of business um, and workers. Because if the company fails and the company goes bankrupt or out of business, then the workers have no opportunity to, to in, in find mm. a job. So the idea is that what we're talking about is that not all of a sudden is that, you know, everything, all money goes to workers, is that the decisions mm. business make, um, how they look after their workers, whether they fire someone or basically place them on temporary leave where they might still have access to healthcare should be done with a rights-based approach so that when companies are making decisions around the pandemic, they may legitimately need to sack certain employees um, because they don't have the ability to pay them. But mm. the argument is that the, the UN guiding principles basically set out a guideline that when you're making decisions, you're doing it um, with human rights focus uh, with it. So some companies have done that um, and some companies have not in relation to it. Hmm. This was the other example um, we gave you at the start, which was specifically relevant to economic, social and cultural rights. Um, so in this, in this one, we're saying there's a company that's manufacturing gloves and because of the pandemic, there's this been really high demand for personal protective equipment. So the company has basically just said to all of its workers, you need to do forced overtime in relation to it. Um, so then the question, um, and they said that the workers will be provided gloves at work, but they're not provided with masks. Um, and the question is the workers are all working very closely together on the production line and they travel to and from their work together on the company bus. So the rights that are relevant here um, might be questions particularly around the right to work, um, the notions of forced overtime, forced labour, so workers have no ability to say no to work, um, that's going to fall into this category of, of workers being forced labourers, which is illegal. Um, the, also the, the requirement of, of companies to provide a self, um, safe and healthy workplace. Um, and so here you have a company that's focused on the production of gloves, but we also know that in this pandemic that um, work at, equipment that workers need, are particularly are masks, and there's also the requirement of social distancing. So if a workplace 
um, is providing workers with some distance, but they're forcing all the workers to travel together on the bus or they're still living in really close dormitories, um, then these companies are not following the UN guiding principles and they're not respecting um, the right to health. And this particular scenario came up um, with uh, some Malaysian companies who are some of the world's companies who produce the world's um, most medical gloves and rubber gloves. Um, and there, a couple of companies there have actually been highlighted in the past as using forced labour, um, where workers have paid recruitment fees or, or working forced overtime without reimbursement. Um, and there were also allegations during the pandemic that they weren't given um, enough e equipment to protect themselves and were being forced to sort of travel in close and live in close confinement with other workers. Oh. Um, and then so a, the question, sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, uh, Justine, if I... Uh, I was well, just saying, well, you know, the, the question around what can she do about this, um, that's replicating many of the, the questions, um, the answers that Yannick was talking about before about, you know, are there any solutions under national law? It's very difficult and often very time consuming and expensive to bring a lawsuit. Um, and most workers, um, particularly in low supply chain workers, don't have the ability to do that. Um, sometimes we've seen that the solution have been is this to make this problem transparent, to basically use the media to get attention for it. Um, and then we've seen, sometimes we've seen companies further up the chain, or in this case also governments, uh, the US government here got involved in this case to basically highlight the problem and try and you know work out a solution into it. So part of the problem which you're highlighting in your comments is that a lot of business and human rights solutions still depend on these sort of soft enforcement measures. That if you're looking for hard law and lawsuits, that's at a national level. And laws vary very much from country to country, the way that they're enforced and their ability um, to get solutions um, in relation to this. So we might pick up um, some questions um, before we, because we're getting near the end of our time. Um, yeah, there's yeah, a, there's yeah, a so. just there's a, there is one uh, very good question by Ben, and he is asking uh, how does uh, Amartya Sen uh, capabilities approach uh, fits in a business human rights discussion? It's, it's a very relevant question because, as you know, Amartya Sen approach uh, basically deals with economic and social rights, uh, trying to advocate that all individuals have these basic capabilities to self uh, realize themselves in order uh, in order to uh, progress uh, uh, in their lives and of course here here there is an uh, interesting question and uh, both Justi justin and myself uh, have written a research on that what are uh, what are business responsibilities as to social economic rights uh, because we know social economic uh, rights are uh, particular rights uh, and they are different. They differ for civil and political rights that uh, they are often obligations of uh, result, not obligation. Obligations of conduct, not obligations of uh, uh, result. They depend on financial resources. Uh, but uh, my my take my take has always been that also businesses have a responsibility to provide at least a, a minimum a minimum reasonable core of social uh, social and economic. Uh, uh, rights, particularly in those uh, scenarios where governments are not willing or are not able to provide for 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 this uh, uh, minimum uh, minimum core, and uh, there are examples from around the world where businesses in this uh, low level regulatory environment environments have stepped in and provided, for example, shelter or. Uh, Water, food, education of the workers, but also larger communities, uh, uh, because the government was not there. The government, who in primary, is responsible to provide for this uh, core of social uh, rights in many contexts, contexts of, of global south, is just not there. And uh, businesses uh, have to step up uh, and uh, and take uh, those uh, uh, those responsibility. Businesses, businesses. One thing, what is, what is really important from this uh, uh, business human, <coughs> human rights context to remember is that businesses do not have only negative obligations, you know, only to respect respect uh, human rights. UNGPs in several art, uh, articles, principles from 
from 13, 14 to 17, 18 principles, they say that businesses have also positive obligations to ensure that uh, their business partners, suppliers, uh, and so on, uh, comply with uh, uh, human, human rights. And I, I will go even, even further, businesses have obligations to ensure the, the minimum core of uh, social, social uh, economic rights. Justin, do you want to answer some questions yourself? Yeah, so there's um, so there was a question here, which I know many of you asked about what happens when <coughs> workers um, are being laid off without, you know, without um, without pay in relation to this. And and here again, it's this balance between um, the ability of the company to survive um, and also, you know, the workers' right to be paid. What we're seeing, um, particularly in this, and there was a question here in relation to the Bangladeshi garment sector. Um, where we saw bad examples of some companies, brands at the top, basically refusing to pay for orders that had already been put in, that had been partially fulfilled, and that the factories had, you know, employed workers to do and, and spent money on um, raw materials in relation to that. And, and that was the very worst of practices. There was also companies who were basically trying to use these, what's called these force majeure um, clauses in contracts. So, uh, they're, they're an example where, you know, if there's an unprecedented disaster, can we cancel the contract? The better examples were particularly some of the really, the world's largest companies who allocated funds to help their suppliers um, sort of keep them afloat during this time. Um, they continued to pay for their contracts, um, you know, which, should, which is a legal obligation in any case. Uh, the companies that were cancelling contracts that had already been Put in were that's generally an illegal process in relation to that. The problem is, you know, it's it's what you've all highlighted in your questions. It's so hard to hold companies to account for this, yeah. and it's this business and human rights is this real mixed method of accountability. So it's looking at national laws, what can be done, and that varies country to country. Um, looking at transparency, you know, we need to know who is involved in that supply chain so we can trace the the failure of the payment of workers at the bottom, right through to the company at the top. Um, the government's responsibility to enforce its laws. So most governments would have laws that would require that type of payment, um, but some countries are simply not enforcing their laws um, in relation to that. And also, always plays a big role is sort of the notion of social media and naming and shaming, um, bringing mm -hmm. attention to these issues. It's not a solution, um, but it's part of this sort of mixed accountability mechanism. And one other thing to think about is the role also of investors. So companies that are investing in these brands and in these supply chains, um, you know, are they putting pressure on the companies themselves? Um, what role might they play in relation to these? And so when you think about business and human rights, you have to think about this really um, sort of intricate and sometimes frustrating web or lack of accountability. Um, mm -hmm. But you have to think about using lots of different leaders um, in order to try and push both business and governments um, to do what's required of them under international human rights law. Um, so we're almost out of time, so I'm going to let you um, have a few more words, Jenny. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with you, Justin. I mean, one has to uh, really adopt, uh, employ holistic, holistic strategy. I mean, one has to use different levels, different mechanisms, state-based, non-state-based mechanisms, judicials, judicial, quasi-judicial, quasi-legal, non-legal mechanisms. And of course, one, uh, one could also you know, resort to more uh, drastic measures, to, to bottom-up measures, you know, uh, taking up uh, protests, uh, you know, uh, expressing the, itself, himself or herself in the media and trying to to highlight the, the issues which are uh, which are, which are at stake because at the moment corporate accountability is very is very weak and I I would agree with those who say that this pandemic shows that we need stronger binding regulations we need the binding regulations both at the domestic level and uh, at, uh, at the international level and I really hope that this initiative for human business human activity uh, will uh, will uh, bear fruit in, uh, in in next years, and that uh, European Union will within one year to adopt 
EU regulation or due diligence, binding EU regulation and due, uh, due diligence. Uh, uh, I hope so, but I'm not very optimistic. I would, uh, I would uh, agree with most of you that this pandemic will uh, not only take toll on the on the you know the rights of workers, uh, uh, the rights uh, in civil and political rights contexts, uh, but also on the on the effectiveness and uh, effectiveness of the development of the business uh, and the human rights uh, regulation. Because nowadays, uh, you can see from your national context, governments are very the governments are very focused to encourage and induce investment and help businesses. But uh, this year in Europe, after this pandemic has finished, most of the European countries now officially has finished. Uh, uh, the governments uh, will be, I would say, quite reserved in in uh, supporting business and human rights regulation. I hope I'm mistaken, but let's see. Yeah, so that is now bringing us to the end of our um, our time. We thank you so much for for joining us for this webinar. I think we're probably finishing on somewhat of a a negative, uh, um, you know, scenario. But we do think that this pandemic will have affected business and human rights like nothing else before it, but not necessarily um, for the better. So thank you very much for joining us, and thank you to the Human Rights Business Academy, and thank you to Oxfam in particular for organising this. Yeah, thank you also from my side. Thank you for Alina. Thank you to, to, to Surya Deva for organizing this. Again, uh, it was an honor to take part in this course. Oh, you are on mute, Alina. Thank you, Justine. Thank you, Yerne. I see a lot of in interesting questions and uh, thank you so much participants for sending in all your questions and our presenters have mostly covered all. But if your question is yet not answered, we'll figure out a way if we could, you know, respond to them later. And uh, so, yeah, we are closing this webinar soon and uh, I hope to see you in the next one at 4 p.m. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you bye. for joining us. Bye.